Well, uh, yeah. afternoon again, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Great to see uh, a large number in the room. Um, and welcome to this uh, seminar on uh, young people in translation, or as you might have seen it in some places, youth in translation. It's got two alternative titles. I'll, I'll explain why in a little minute. Um, my name's Paul Kay. I work for the European Commission. I work as a translator at the European Commission. European Commission, one of several institutions and bodies that make up the European Union Civil Service Government Administration. And uh, we have uh, lots and lots of translators working in that European Civil Service. Over 4,000 staff translators, mainly located in Brussels and in Luxembourg, who uh, do translation for the EU. And uh, this seminar is being held under the European Commission's Translating Europe initiative. Translating Europe is the name that we give to our program of outreach with the wider translation community in Europe. Um, and each year, for instance, we hold a, a forum, a big forum called the Translating Europe Forum in Brussels. The next one is, I think, the 29th and 30th of October. I think we like to see it as some kind of uh, translation, European Translation Summit, something like that. If you haven't got tickets for the seminar in Brussels, the, the, um, the Translating Europe Forum in Brussels, you can follow it online. If you uh, search for Translating Europe Forum, you can find that. You'll be able to follow it online. But in addition to that uh, major forum that we hold every year in Brussels, we also hold um, national events that we call workshops. So we have National Translating Europe workshops. And this seminar is one of those workshops. I think that's the third in the series. So held at national level. And uh, in that, the European Commission works with partners, um, and I think all three events we've held in conjunction with the Institute of Translation and Interpreting and the Chartered Institute of Linguists, the two main professional bodies for translators in this country, and we're very pleased to work with them. Um, and so when we were thinking about what we wanted to, uh, you, what, what theme we wanted to address at our Translating Europe workshop, uh, this year here at the, the Language Show, we, uh, we looked at the Translating Europe Forum um, and the theme for that Translating Europe Forum next week or the week after is uh, or was originally Youth in Translation, Youth in Translation. So we just took the same title, we said we'll do Youth in Translation and then we thought, well actually, how old do you have to be to be a youth? Where does, where does, a, where does being a youth end? And we looked into it a bit more and, and spoke to our colleagues in Brussels who had thought up this title and the theme for the Translating Europe Forum, and we realized we were actually really targeting people who are a bit older than youths, because in English, I think youth probably ends at maybe 16 or 17. So we decided we would rename it uh, as being young people in translation, not youth in translation, but uh, it's still youth in translation on some of the material that you'll have seen. So we chose young people in translation as our theme, and what we decided to do was to invite a panel together of uh, people who are still classified as young, in our eyes anyway, um, who have been making their way in translation, in various fields of translation and in various uh, different, um, different forms of translation, uh, and get them to talk about their experiences as young people in the translation sector. And then to allow you to ask your questions to them, maybe some of you are young people yourselves and you're aspiring translators and you might want to benefit from their wisdom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our panel to introduce themselves, first of all, one by one, and just with a couple of minutes explain uh, a little bit about their background, what they do, um, their journey so far in translation, and then we're just going to throw it open to you to ask questions of the panel. Um, and if you don't have any questions, I as chair will, will think up some questions that we'll put to them and hopefully we'll get the discussion going. Uh, so I'm going to start off uh, by asking the panel one by one. I'll start with Lloyd Bingham, first of all, on the right as you look at it, to introduce himself and uh, talk to you for a couple of minutes. Lloyd. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon. My name is Lloyd Bingham uh, and I run my own translation business as a freelance translator in Cardiff. I'm a translator from French, German, Spanish, and Dutch into English. I first thought about translation as a career in the last year of my undergraduate degree uh, when I studied at Newcastle because I really enjoyed and you know, frankly was good at the, the translation modules that were offered as part of my degree. 
but crucially, I noticed that my reading and writing skills were much higher than my sort of speaking and listening skills in my uh, foreign languages. Uh, that's why I'd make a pretty crap interpreter. So when I was at uni and thinking about becoming a translator, I realised I'd need some good practical experience under my belt. Um, and that would put me then in a strong position when applying for in-house jobs, because that's what I wanted to do. Rather than study for a master's, I wanted to sort of uh, acquire experience in-house. So not only did I translate as part of my language degree, um, which of course counts as experience on your CV, I also sought to gain volunteer experience. Uh, and I did that by approaching the Welsh National Opera in Cardiff, because I knew that they worked with languages uh, in their profession, with their performances, uh, things like that. And I worked with one of their translators to translate some poems from German into English. So that was some good voluntary experience that I thought employers would really value. And I worked hard on my CV to really emphasize my translation experience, um, as well as the skills that I'd acquired at university, because I didn't really have any life experience at that stage. Uh, and it's good to highlight your linguistic and cultural skills on your CV too. Uh, you know, what modules are you studying? What kind of knowledge is that giving you? And what kind of skills can you take from that that you might be able to apply to translation? So I built a website to try and stand out while I was still studying uh, and looking to apply for in-house translation jobs. And this website was basically an extension of my CV. And I was able to go into more detail about what I'd learned from these uh, translation modules. And um, it also functioned as a blog. And I'd often blog about translation-related issues. And I'd sometimes sort of do translations just for fun. Let's say I'd go onto the, uh, the German news website, Build. I'd take an article from that and translate it and then put it on my website. Again, I thought that's something uh, potential employers would really value. After doing that, I did some research into what translation companies there are in the UK. Uh, that employed in-house translators, because it's crucial to make that difference. Some don't employ in-house translators. Some exclusively outsource uh, their work to freelancers. So I sent out speculative applications. I wasn't really applying for specific positions with these translation companies. Uh, I was just emailing them my CV out of the blue. But I was called in for an interview with one of these in-house translation companies. Um, and I was sitting uh, translation tests and doing these interviews at the same time as doing my final exams for university. Uh, I got the job, fortunately, and I spent three years at this translation company in Northumberland, training on the job, uh, working under very experienced senior translators who'd all provide feedback on my work. That's how, essentially, I learned to translate. Uh, and that helped me to also develop specialisms, uh, in-depth knowledge of um, marketing and business techs, which I enjoy the most, uh, but also legal and technical fields, because if you work for an in-house translation company, uh, they do try to get you to do as much as possible and whatever their clients send them, basically. So you do get a lot of intensive uh, training that way. After two years there, I uh, moved into a senior translation position myself. Um, so it was my turn to review the translations of less experienced translators. I left that job at just over a year ago, moved back to Cardiff and started my own uh, translation business, which I now run to date. Um, so that was uh, July or August last year. So I've only been freelancing for about a year. Uh, my old company was my first client. Uh, of course, and in the early days of my business, I approached several agencies, but my best clients have come to me through um, my membership of the ITI, because if you uh, join a professional association like that, you get listed in their uh, online database, and client, the top clients know about this database, and they can find you uh, through that. Um, another major source of good clients is referrals, and if you build your professional network, if you're online a lot, uh, in a professional capacity, you'll meet other professionals, uh, develop relationships with them, that can lead to uh, them referring their clients to you. That's, that's another source uh, of work. And it works both ways. I, in turn, pass work on to them. Um, so that's my pathway so far. Great. Thanks for that, Lloyd. OK, we'll go s straight on to our next speaker, who's Jessica, Cuc Hi. Jessica Cucchiarini. Hi, my name is Jessica. Uh, I graduated from a university in Italy with a degree in modern languages, English and Spanish. Uh, my undergraduate degree involved a year abroad at the University of Birmingham and I followed a few modules in translation and that's when I got really interested in translation I decided I wanted to be a translator. So I moved back to Birmingham and I started a master's in translation studies. Um, during my postgraduate degree I had the opportunity to specialise in medical translation um, so uh, with a particular interest in clinical trials documents. 
Uh, my dissertation was a translation from English into Italian uh, of a patient information sheet and a clinical trial protocol that two medical documents used in clinical trials. And then I decided I wanted to start my own business and I managed to do that with the help of a University Business Enterprise Award. So I managed to build my own website. I did it myself, it took a while, three months, and I translated it into different languages with the help of uh, obviously a uh, native speaker of Spanish and English. And uh, I also work as a project manager full time in a translation company. So in the future, I would like to work as a translator full time and not as a project manager, but I think it's a really good uh, opportunity to see what the other side, what the other side look like, what, what rates they're asking for. And yeah, so you get to know the translation industry. And um, I think it was really important to do like workshop and seminars uh, in uh, medical translation, to specialize in medical translation, because obviously agencies at the beginning, they'll, they won't trust you to do medical translation if you are just a new freelance. So you need to show that you are able to do medical translation. So I did a lot of courses in biology. So I went back to school, <laughs> biology and then medicine and uh, cancer science. Uh, so just to show people that I have the knowledge to do medical translation. And my work at the moment is translation of patient information sheet, uh, patient leaflet, and case report or related to medical documents, but also uh, general text. Yeah, that's me. Okay, thanks, Jessica. The next speaker is Helen Oakley-Brown. Uh, hello, I'm Helen. I'm a freelance translator. I've been a freelance translator for about six years. Um, and I translate business texts, and by that I mean promotional texts, so sort of marketing, websites, brochures. Um, and I work from French and Spanish. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in modern languages, in French and Spanish. Um, and in my final year, I was a bit worried because I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't really know anything other than, you know, I could speak French and Spanish. And then we had uh, translation modules and translation as, you know, for translation to write good texts and to write purposeful texts rather than translation as a linguistic exercise. Found out I was good at it, I really enjoyed it. And speaking to my tutors, they encouraged me to do a master's and um, I did a master's at Westminster. And that was more of a, a writing course, really. They really um, got our English into good shape because you know, your, your target language, the language you translate into, is your real selling point. It's got to be beautiful. Um, and then, so I did that master's and I picked up two other languages on the way, although I, I don't use them anymore, but I did study Portuguese and Polish um, with my master's and they were, when I first went freelance, they were a really good hook to get clients in because, you know, something exotic, not that they are, but um, French and Spanish are so common that having two other languages was a real selling point. I've only ever worked in translation. I got my first job as a terminologist because of one of my tutors um, at, my, at, at Westminster. They posted a job, I applied for it. Um, as a terminologist, my job was to compile uh, glossaries and translation memories from previous translations so we could sort of recycle um, work and keep all of our work consistent. That, mean, that meant I had to um, learn how to use translation memory software and uh, develop my IT skills, which are essential if you're going to work as a translator. Um, I did that for about a year, and then I really missed actually writing and translating, so I got a job as a translator and a project manager. It's a combined job at a small translation agency, and the agency was only about two years old, and we had to do everything at first. It was great fun. We had to, you know, sales, marketing, negotiation, and translate and outsource jobs to um, other linguists. And at first I was translating quite a bit, and it was brilliant, but as time went on, the company grew. I ended up managing more, which is not, what I, not where I wanted to go. And so I jumped ship and I went freelance um, six years ago. Uh, one of the first things I did when I was freelance, I uh, took the ITI, it was called Peer Support Group then, I think it's now starting up as a freelance translator. It's an online course um, led by uh, 
some of the best in their field, I, I, I imagine we can call them, um, uh, translators who really make you think of yourself as a business and how to set up, how to, you know, basic things like invoicing and CVs and practical things that you, you, know, you really have to master. Lloyd's actually now one of the uh, tutors on the course, so I imagine he'll be talking about that later. Uh, but that really uh, changed my mindset and got me thinking more about myself as a business and as a freelancer and how I had to sell my services to clients. Uh, and then, yes, so over time I've been building up my specialisms, so, so I work mostly with business texts. And uh, last year, I sat the ITI exam, so I'm now a qualified member. And as Lloyd said, it's great because you're then, as well as all the other benefits that being in a professional organisation bring, you're also listed on the ITI site, which is a big, a big um, pull for clients. And yes, I think, I think that's me done. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Helen. The next speaker is Tom Gale. Hi, um, so my background in languages probably started in about year three or four. I joined my primary school French club, um, really enjoyed that, carried on with languages all the way through secondary school, uh, ended up with A-level French, carried on with French university, um, studied French with international studies at the University of Warwick, which included a uh, year abroad as a teaching assistant in Paris. Um, sometime about halfway through my, my degree, I was just kind of thinking, what am I going to do? Um, I want to use my language. Um, I don't want to really go into some kind of graduate scheme or that type of, that type of uh, stream. Um, so I did start thinking about translation a bit like Helen. Um, and a couple of the modules that we did at Warwick did involve translation both ways, English to French and French to English which I really quite enjoyed, particularly the whole problem-solving aspect of it. Um, so my final year, I attended a Roots into Language event at Aston University, where they're talking about careers in translation and interpreting. And uh, I ended up doing a master's at Aston, um, translation in a European context, which is part of the European Masters in Translation Network, which is a partnership program between the European Commission and a number of universities in the UK and across Europe. I think the UK has about 12 university courses linked uh, to that program all around, all around the country as well. Uh, my master's was a mixture of academic, uh, so things like translation theories, so dissertation, and uh, a project on language for special purposes, so legal language, medical language, that type of thing. After I finished my master's, I did a short internship at a translation company in Leamington Spa, and then spent all the money I earned from that going to Spain, learned a bit of Spanish, and came back with no money, and um, found myself in a job in project management. Um, I did that for two years. Uh, it was at a small agency, so that kind of required it's an all-encompassing job. There was a small bit of translation, um, some editing, proofreading, sales, marketing, uh, quoting, invoicing, um, vendor management, anything you can think of that goes on a translation company, I more or less did it, um, to the point where after two years I thought, right, I definitely want to be translating now. Um, so like Helen, I, I left and have been translating freelance from my office slash bedroom in, uh, in Blackheath in South East London. Um, I translate from French and Spanish to English and I specialize in uh, medicine. Great, thanks very much, Tom. And our final speaker, I think, has a, a, a slightly different story because she works for a different kind of organization to the previous four, is Catherine Knight. Oh, yes, my name's Catherine. Uh, I work as a translator at the Council of the European Union and uh, I actually studied law rather than modern languages. I um, graduated in 2008 with uh, an English and French law degree. So that involved two years of studying law in the UK at Sheffield Hallam University and two years of studying French law at uh, Paris 12 University. 
Uh, I then went on to work as a legal assistant in Paris and London for five years. Um, and all of my legal experience involved languages to some extent. So for example, I worked in um, a UK law firm based in Paris in the asset finance department. Um, I worked in uh, an American law firm in London um, on a, a large-scale project involving a French client, so lots and lots of French language documents to trawl through. Um, in 2013, I decided I was ready for a change, um, and I entered the 2013 English language translator competition organized by the European Personnel Selection Office, or EPSO. And I joined the council in January of this year. <clears throat> so I currently work from French and Spanish into English. Um, I learned Spanish through um, evening classes and intensive language courses in Spain and South America. Um, but didn't actually study Spanish as part of my degree. I'm also studying Bulgarian as of last month. So I know how to say, my name is Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about it. Um, but in theory, in three years, I should be able to translate from Bulgarian as well. I think that's about it. Okay, great, Catherine. Thanks, thanks very much. So each of our panelists have sketched out briefly um, their situation, how they got into translation, where they are in their translation careers. I'm going to throw it open now straight away to you to ask, ask questions of them if you want advice, if you want to ask about any particular aspect of their career so far. I should also say that all three organisations that are co-organising this event, the European Commission, the Chartered Institute of Linguists and the Institute of Translation and Interpreting, we all have stands downstairs in the exhibition. So if you want to find out more information, you can come and talk to us down there and various people on the panel uh, are, are on those stands, including me, which is why I'm wearing this T-shirt and not a smart uh, shirt and tie. I ask a yes or no question to the panel. Um, you are young people who've now had a bit of experience of the translation sector. Would you recommend to other young people, younger people than you, to go into translation? Is it an area that you'd recommend uh, young people to go into? Yes or no? Just, uh, just down, the, down the line. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hey, with all that encouragement, I hope there's a, a question in the audience. Anybody want to put the first one? Hi, do you have regular customers that you use, clients, or do you have to spend a lot of your time seeking new ones because you just get the odd job here and there? And how long, if you do, how long does that take to establish? Yes, a bit of both. Um, I do have regular clients um, sending me jobs every couple of weeks or every week. And then, but you have to set aside, you can't translate 40 hours a week, you have to set aside time every week as a freelancer to hunt out a uh, new business. So it's a bit of both. But yes, there, I do have a steady flow, but I make sure there's time, you know, because there's always another opportunity, a uh, more interesting client, perhaps better paying client, and you should always be on the lookout. And also as a freelancer, if someone just, you know, stops calling for whatever reason, you may, you, it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong, but that's, you lose that income stream. So you can't really rely on just one or two. You have to keep a few in the works. Uh, yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, I'd say it took me about nine months or so of freelance or being a full-time freelancer before I got a real steady stream in and I kind of knew that I'd be able to pay the bills. Um, not, that's not to say I'm fully established or have kind of like a, a big career plan, but um, I think in my first first few months, I sent off hundreds and hundreds of application letters to agencies, um, which initially wasn't so successful, but now my best and in terms of probably almost pay, uh, regular client, um, friendly people to work with, good payers, the whole the whole lot, they contacted me out of the blue about six months after I'd sent them my application to say, oh, notice you do this, you do medical. 
uh, can you take on this proofreading project for us? And then since then, it's grown and grown and grown. And they're now, yeah, they're now my best client. So it, it does take time initially. Um, and as Helen says, you have to keep working at it. Um, you can't spend all your time fixated on, on a good client because they could be here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> so be patient and it will yes. come. <laughs> I've had, uh, I've had that as well. I've sort of approached a new client, um, and sometimes they don't even respond to you, but then they'll come back to you six months, maybe a year later, mm. suddenly they need your services in your specific languages or, um, or specialisms. Um, when, you, when you do start out, you spend a lot of time approaching new clients. Uh, agencies are the safest bet to start off with. Um, but some do go straight to direct clients first. Um, and regular clients make up the most of my work too, but you know, you do get approached by uh, sort of ad hoc clients, um, sometimes private individuals who need their marriage certificate translated and then they'll never need anything off you again. Um, but I think one of the keys to success, um, from my point of view, is establishing a good working relationship with long-term clients to ensure a good, uh, a reliable stream of income. And you should, even if you're in a comfortable position, you think you've got good clients, they're paying you a good rate, you should still be looking for even better clients. Hi, I'm Eva. I'm a German and English interpreter and translator. And I have been freelance for two years now. And I don't have a website. And I was wondering how you feel about that and um, whether you recommend it's very important or not. Because I feel um, it's always praised as the best way to get work. But I feel memberships and being on registers is sufficient. Not always, but has been very good for me. So I was wondering what you recommend in terms of online presence. Hi. Um, well, I started not long ago to work as a freelance, as well as project manager. And I did my website my, myself. And there's a lot of um, online platform you can use to do your, your website, and you can build it as you like. And uh, obviously, there are adverts at the bottom, but you can get rid of them paying a fee every year. And uh, it was hard work, but I think it was worth because what people do nowadays is just Google your name. And if they see your face, they see yourself mm -hmm. as a person, I think that will make them trust you. Like, they see who you are. You see, they see that you are a real person because sometimes, you know, translators, they can just... People can just say, oh, I'm a translator, but then you can't find them anywhere online. But it's good to have an online presence, I think, because, you know, they see how you are, they see how you look, you see that you are a person, and they can see what you've done until now. So I think it's a good way to start a website. Yeah, I think it needs to be very professional. It doesn't need to have any grammar errors <laughs> as well, because it doesn't look very good for a translator to have mistakes in the website, but I think it's a good way to start. I would say yes to a website, absolutely. It's a good shop window and it's um, a chance for you to market yourself however you want to. Make sure it's slick, make sure it's beautifully written and all of that. Um, I would say in terms of other um, sort of on, in other sources of online visibility, there is a difference between being on a portal Again, it's very good for SEO and your Google rankings, but there's a difference between that and having a listing in a professional association. It gives you an extra quality stamp, um, and I think that's an important, important distinction to make. Yeah, Tom. just to just to agree with what, what Jessica was saying, it is, I found having a website is quite a nice way to, to introduce yourself in, in, in a more personal way. Um, you can't really do when you're sending off your CV to a client or an agency um, in when I was a project manager, it is it feels like a, a better relationship when you see that someone you're dealing with quite frequently has a website. You can see it's not really stalking, but you can kind of see what they're doing. You see that they're legitimate in in what they do. They might have a blog. They might um, just like like I do. I keep a relatively updated list of a summary of recent projects just to just so people um, looking at my CV they might have a look at the website and say okay he's this is what this is what he's doing um, and when I was a project manager I did I did value a personal relationship with 
um, a lot of translators, some of whom I'm still in contact with now. Um, so it's, it's a great way of getting in with, um, with agencies or, or other clients and developing that relationship so that they think of you when they need something done. Do you have multilingual um, pages on your website? I don't yet. Yeah. Not yet, but I'm working on it. You say you do, Jessica. Which languages? Yes, I have. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, I have Italian, of course. I'm Italian, and then I have English and Spanish, and um, I've translated them with the help of native speakers, of course, an English native speaker and Spanish native speakers. Um, but yeah. It took me a while, but it was worth because obviously some of my clients are English, they need translation into Italian, some of them are Spanish, and of course if they can see, they can read about me in their own language, that is, is better. My name's Christina, I'm considering translation as a um, career. I had a question specifically for Tom. You mentioned that you um, specialise in medical um, translations, but you studied uh, languages at university. So how did you get that specialism? Um, I'm spe well, essentially, I've been specialising as I've gone, um, kind of le learning on the job, so to speak. Um, I'd say it's still, still the case that the majority of people going into translation come from a languages background, as opposed to working in industry or, um, say, I guess, I guess the big three are kind of legal, financial, and medical. Um, most people's translators still come from a linguistic background first. Um, so I've been partly through CPD workshops with professional associations, both with Charter Institute of Linguists um, and I'm also a member of the ITI Medical Network. Um, I've had, I've gone through a mentoring program with them. Um, I'm currently get, doing a course on medical terminology. Um, and I guess it's a way of starting slow, starting small, um, starting more general, and then working your way into more uh, more technical aspects as you go. Um, I found that asking other translators for help is very useful um, because I think I think translators are really keen on helping each other. I think it's quite a, I guess partly because we're quite isolated as freelancers, often working from home. Um, it's it's a way of building up your own kind of your own social network, really, of um, of peer to peer aid. And yeah, I'm I'm still specialising, um, but I'm at the stage where I feel confident that what in in what I can do and what I can't do, um, you shouldn't be afraid of telling. If if you really can't do something, you look at it and you think it's horrid, you shouldn't be afraid to say no thanks. Um, it's always a bad idea to bite off more than you can chew. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, push yourself and try to, yeah, t take a challenge if you think you can, if you think you can do it. Can I add something? I specialise in medical as well, and I did a masters in translation. Um, so I asked my supervisor, and I said, "How can I specialise in medical translation?" Because we were doing all sorts of different documents at, um, at the university. And she said, well, if you want to specialize in medical, then in the practical course, you just choose your text, and I'll give you some text to translate, some medical text. Obviously, those translations are in my portfolio. So even if it was university work, you can still use it as your portfolio and show that you've done that translation in that specific field. Um, yeah, And also, I've done a lot of courses in medical translation, but also um, courses in biology, so to show clients that I have the knowledge. So I did courses in biology, courses in cancer science, uh, courses in medicine. Obviously, they were all general uh, courses or not too specialized, but it's a good way to start uh, learning a new field, especially when you have a language background. And also, it's a good way to show that you are committed and you know what you're doing, especially to agencies and clients. 
Um, I also done a course, a certificate, it's called GCP, which is a good clinical practice. And usually doctors and nurses have to do that certificate, but I decided to do it myself. Um, so it's a good way to show, you know, that you, you are willing to learn uh, medicine and medical documents and you have the knowledge to do translation in medical documents, yeah. So I think it's good to have yeah, medical translation courses, but as well as some other things like biology or medicine, if you want to specialise in medical translation. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, there are, um, there are master's programmes that do, uh, I, think, I think Imperial does one. Um, UCL. Yeah, yeah, medical and scientific translation. Um, and then th th there are others that do, particularly for legal as well. Um, on the subject of, of medical and scientific in particular, there are... The internet is full of excellent resources and reliable resources as well. I have my own uh, paper dictionaries, which are which sent me back quite a lot. A um, small one, about A5, costs about eighty pounds for <laughs> bilingual French English. Um, but there are yeah, there are resources absolutely everywhere, um, and reliable ones too. Uh, courses in in ranging from the very general anatomy all the way down into yeah, medical statistics, oncology, and absolutely I've anything. I've used um, a lot. It's called FutureLearn. It's an online mm. website that you can just uh, sign up and just follow a course online. You don't have to pay for it, and you just watch it at home. It's like videos. Um, that was a good way to start. Okay, thanks. So that touches on the idea of training and continuing professional development. I mean, big, big areas for, for, for translators. So I noticed that most of you had an in-house job position before going freelance. And I would like to ask, as a young graduate, what kind of jobs do we need to keep an eye for before stepping into the freelancing uh, position? Because yeah, I understand that in-house translate, translation jobs are not many. And what's the position that we need to look for when we graduate in order to build a network, a good reputation, and gain the essential skills? Um, I'll go. Um, there's a lot to be said for working in the field you want to specialize in. So I, I don't know what you're focusing on but going out and working in that industry and coming back to translation once you've acquired all that knowledge, that's another way of getting your specialism, and working either in your source or target culture. Um, other than that, I, I, my first job was in a... So it's a marketing company, but it, I, it it's, has the translation department, so I worked um, in a linguistic role, but I think there's nothing like getting in, in field experience. Yeah, Catherine. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, I don't have any experience working for a translation company, but um, I mean, yes, I guess working in a law firm um, is similar, and doing translations in a law firm is um, similar to working for a translation company in that you don't have to um, think about looking for clients, you don't have to think about doing all the other... Um, Sort of periphery tasks that freelancers uh, have to deal with. If you want to work in-house, you don't just have to pursue specifically in-house translation positions. You could consider a project manager role or a proofreader role um, because both of those positions will, uh, are still highly relevant to translation. Uh, working as a PM, that will obviously teach you a lot about the practicalities of the industry and will really prepare you for when you go freelance. And uh, starting off as a proofreader, also that's a stepping stone to becoming a translator. Um, and I know many people who've started off as a proofreader or a PM who've then sidestepped into uh, a translation role, either within the same company or um, as another company, because they've now got that sort of initial experience. So you could still work within the translation uh, industry in-house, but not necessarily starting off as an in-house translator. Yeah, just to, just to add to that... Um... I was at the, the panel leaders discussion this morning and they were talking about internships and things like that um, and n none of them mentioned any roles as, as in-house in translators. They're all in project management, vendor management, um, 
marketing, business development, or, or, that, or that type of thing. Um, that said, um, I learned so much as a project manager. Um, I would, if you're going to go into project management, I would recommend, I'd probably recommend a smaller agency over a larger agency um, because you're probably going to be given a, a wider remit. You're going to have more input into the business. You're going to be trusted more with, with doing different tasks and different roles like I was. Um, and yeah, it, it helps you build, I think it helps you build more of a relationship with, um, with both, both people in your, in your agency and the translators and, and proofreaders you work with. And you get a really wide view of the industry, how it works, um, what to look at. You, if you work recruiting translators, you, you get to know what people want from translators so that when you leave, you know what you need to get um, or, or start preparing for that before. I mean, I finished the CIOL Diploma in Translation this year, um, but I'd actually started it while I was still project managing. So I took one exam um, the year before I left and then I took the final exam this year. Um, so that way, when I left, I'd already said, I, I could already put my CV working towards it, already have one exam under my belt and continuing on. Um, yeah, that's, I'm rambling a bit now. <laughs> okay, thanks. And the next question. And hi, yeah, um, actually the uh, previous girl more or less asked my question. It was just about the um, um, in-house jobs and if you could give any tips on how to actually find in-house uh, companies offering in-house jobs, whether there's any way of knowing which companies are likely to have those because of course they are so rare um, and especially depending on your language combination. So uh, if you could give any help with that. Yeah, Floyd. Um, there's a company on the exhibition hall downstairs called Multilingual Vacancies. Uh, if you register with them, they uh, have uh, vacancies crop up from time to time uh, with in-house translation companies. There's also um, a, an association called the Association of Translation Companies, uh, or translation companies in the UK. If you go onto their website, uh, they've got a list of all their members, essentially all the, the translation companies registered with them in the UK. Not all of them will employ in-house translators, so you will have to sort of um, uh, try and find that out for yourself, but that should give you a starting point of you know, who, who's out there, what translation companies are there in this country. Also, if you're still studying, um, your careers department as well uh, might have relationships with certain translation companies. So it's worth asking with them as well. Um, Helen? I, I also think, uh, am I right in saying the ITI post jobs online? And I think the CIOL does as well. So they're always a good, you know, they're always good places to go to. Hi there. One of the um, barriers, I suppose, for young people or people starting out in translation is lack of experience. And um, I've seen a lot of um, job ads and things where they say minimum two years experience or three years experience. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a bit about um, how you present your experience in terms of on your CV, especially if it's bitty freelance jobs here and there, or if you include your university um, experience or and how you kind of, not, not just how you get it, but how you present it. And, and when, when they say two years, does that mean like two years full time or what does it mean? Uh, so when I first started, I was very lucky, when I first started as a freelancer, I was very lucky that my, well, like Lord, my um, old employer was my first client and they actually gave me a sort of a set chunk every week of work, which was nice. So I was able to build up experience with that. Um, but I, did uh, use my, uh, I did a, as part of my master's, I did a project, an extended translation, and I did use that in a, you know, as a portfolio piece when I first got started. Um, and I did a few voluntary pieces of translation as well, and then just built them up into a portfolio. And, I, and I'd already had some in-house experience, so I quickly built up two years. Um, but it doesn't have, your experience doesn't have to be paid. It has to be very good. What you produce has to be very good, but it could be pro bono, or it could be even things that you've produced at university, and you can um, include those. The important thing is to be honest. Um, you can't pretend you have 10 years' experience. You've only got two. But as long as you're you know, straight with the client, I think that's fine. 
as she said, I've also used my dissertation as my portfolio because I did an extended <laughs> translation project. Well, before doing my dissertation, I decided I wanted to start working as a translator, and that was how to start doing actual, you know, actual work. And you can use your dissertation as your portfolio if it's a translation project. And also, I did some volunteering jobs as well. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree that experience and prerequisite experience is, is a problem in the industry, particularly with, um, I guess, agencies who, that, that are more, considered more reputable because of maybe ISO standards or, or other standards they have to adhere to. They have to have it written that they only take people with minimum three, minimum five years experience, etc. The way I did it was um, I, I took a lot of work when I first started out at, at, at lower pay um, rates that I would never charge now. But I, I used it as an opportunity to, to get the experience. It wasn't just money to put in the bank. It was, it was, money, it was to show that I've been working in translation. Um, and I mean, pro project management is translation experience. Um, so when I left project management, I said on my CV, it's, well, I have two and a half years experience in translation. I mean, and it's quite clear from my CV that two of those years were in project management, but that, that still means that I am experienced in translation. I, I know what's involved, I know what you have to do. I've done pro bono work with Translators Without Borders. I think that was one of the first things I did when, when I left was, was sign up with them, take their test, because you have to do a test to, to get on there. Um, they're well known throughout the world, um, particularly with, with agencies. So if they know, and I've got a little um, icon on my website that updates whenever I do a project for them. So I think at the moment I've got 20,000 words or so translated with them. And that, that just shows that you are doing regular translation. Um, I also, as I said earlier, I was kind of doing my dip trans on the side. And when I did one of the exams, I managed to find the text online that I'd taken for the exam. And once I found out that I'd passed, um, I said that I passed it and I put up a link to the text so they could see the type of text that I've done in an exam situation um, and, and done well in. So it's, again, it, I, it's, a lot of it is how you say it. It's yeah. um, showing that you are experienced without having, without saying that, okay, I spent five years translating. <laughs> yeah, two and a half years in translation, clever use of words. Yeah. Which, but that's what translation is all about. So exactly. You, you, were just, you were just demonstrating that. As the other panellists said, the most important thing is that you have some sort of portfolio on your CV in whatever form it takes. When I applied for my in-house job, and I was still in the last year of my undergraduate language degree, all I had on my CV in terms of translation experience was what I'd done uh, on, on my language degree. Uh, and the, the voluntary translation I did, those poems that I was talking about, only uh, did a translation of 12 very short German into English poems. So only the, those two items of experience. Um, and that experience on my university course was only part of a language degree. So if you do a master's in translation, think about all the experience that that gives you. But there's also other channels of experience that you could pursue. Um, in terms of voluntary translation, you could approach uh, organizations, local or national um, arts organizations in particular. S some tend to work with uh, people around the world uh, and therefore have uh, translation requirements. There are, I know um, some people when they start out in translation they, uh, there's, a, there's a multilingual website, news website called Cafe Babel, which publishes uh, news articles in a variety of, of languages and has uh, volunteers translate them. Um, so that's a really good way to get started. Cafe Babel, that website is called. Um, so they'll, they'll publish articles in German, French, uh, and you'll translate them into English. Uh, but there's lots of other language combinations too. It's also, even if you're still a student, it's worth considering joining a professional organization, either the ITI or CIOL. ITI in particular has student membership. Um, and joining that, that early on in your career will give you access to, um, uh, to the professional network 
out there, but, but also in, if, if you're applying for in-house jobs, you know, membership of ITI so early on in your career is, is going to look fantastic, I think. And employers will really value that. Sam, Sam Saleh. I was born to an English mother and Egyptian father. And since then, I've been speaking both Arabic and English, obviously, all the time. And I um, worked for several uh, national, com uh, national and international companies. But now I'm wondering how can I get the companies who are working in their field, but they don't uh, deal with the Middle East basically because they don't know the language. So they just go on to other areas. How can one find that out? So you're looking to find out uh, companies that work in your language, but they don't know that language? No. Sorry, I misunderstood. Companies that are not taking notice of the, the Arabic language because they don't have anybody and they are busy with their own business with other companies. But in, in, in the future, maybe they would like to get in, uh, to, to uh, make work with the Middle East. Okay. And that's where I would st step in. Okay, uh, well let's put that over to the panel. Does anybody have any ideas on that? Um, well, you can't sell to people who don't want to, to buy unfortunately, uh, but um, you could target them at um, trade fairs, I don't know which areas you work in, but go and meet them and just see if there is, people go and meet, by them I mean people in that industry, and see if there is any interest, and it involves doing an awful lot of market research to see where the opportunities for translation are. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm afraid I don't think about the Middle East because it's not an area I work with, but I think it just comes down to a lot of market research and finding, and finding your clients. As Helen said, it would be up to yourself to invest a lot of time in finding out what companies um, want to maybe, uh, what companies in the UK perhaps want to expand uh, into the Arab, Arabic-speaking world. Um, I know there's um, a government organisation called UKTI, UK Trade and Investment, who help businesses in the UK go into different markets. Um, so let's say you've got a business in the UK who wants to go into Egypt, UKTI will then help that business launch in Egypt. Uh, and they also work with translators uh, in order to translate everything they need into Arabic in this example. So that's, uh, they're called UKTI, so they're really helpful. Yeah. They're, yeah, yeah, they'd be on the exhibition floor, wouldn't they? So you could have a chat with, with someone from them. And they, uh, that applies to translators working from English into, a, into another language, because they work with companies uh, expanding all over the world. My name's Rahana, and I'm currently studying a degree in translation. And I wanted to know, when did you make the decision about the speciali specialization you wanted to go into and how did you make that decision? And if you think it's important for students to make it earlier on in their degree? Um, I made my decision probably while I was project managing. Um, so when, yeah, so, so when I entered the translation industry, I didn't have a specialization and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I think through, through project management, looking at different texts that came in, uh, different projects that were ongoing, I got a, a bit of a feeling about what I didn't like, which was legal, marketing, um, finance found quite boring. Um, and then, yeah, I, different things came up, scientific things I found quite interesting. Um, I had a bit of a science background at school, but not since then. Um, and then... That there's also market research in terms of the translation industry, what, what things are, what fields are, um, where, where, there are where there's a lot of translation. Um, there's medical translation all over the world, legal, financial, those, those are the, and business and marketing, those are the main, main ones. Um, but at the same time, if there's, there's anything that, you, that you're particularly interested in, any particular field that you like, um, academic fields or, or things like that, that that can also help to, to push you into a specialisation. It's good 
it's always good to do something you enjoy, which is why, I mean, it's not, it wasn't that much of a flippant remark when I said I didn't like financial or, um, because if, if you are going to be working for it and you, you need to promote yourself and work very hard, particularly at the start, just to get your, to get your feet off the ground, you need to be doing it in something that, that you enjoy and you think you can learn from. Um, what I like a lot about medical is that it is, it gives the opportunity for continual learning. I mean, I don't think, 30 years time, I'm sure I won't know half as much as um, any kind of specialised doctor, but I'll still be learning every single day doing different projects. Um, I would say get a specialism as soon as you can. And if you're still studying, I don't know whether there's any opportunity to study modules in that particular field and then maybe go and do an inter internship in your source language country in that area. Um, you can never you know, load too much uh, and it's your specialism along with your writing skills are your real selling points. Um, the, I, the aim ultimately would be to blend in with people in their industry and they won't know you're a translator. They'll just think you're one of them. So start as early as you can, get some formal training, work experience, would be brilliant, and um, yes, make a decision as soon as you can. You can you can start quite early, even when you're still studying to specialise, because there are there are some really good online translator training providers. Um, one I can think of is called ECPD Webinars, and they're called Alexandria Project, and they offer a, a really wide array of specialist webinars specifically for translators on and interpreters, and they're quite good value as well. Um, I think they start about £25 each. Uh, and again, if that's on your CV, even when you're a student, that's going to look fantastic, I think. But that's a way you could start specialising right now. And don't forget um, MOOCs, uh, what is it? massive online open courses, or the O's maybe, the other way around. <laughs> but um, that some are, most are free, I think, some are paid for. Um, uh, there's a app for your Coursera app and their courses run by universities all around the world in different languages um, taught by specialists and it's you know another avenue you can you can explore to so follow your interests and it's never too early to specialize uh, there's a lady in the front row here hi my name is Kasia and I've nearly qualified as a translator I've just submitted my master's dissertation in translation studies so um, now, I've got a question. I actually have two questions. Uh, one question a little bit uh, negative, because as a, um, as a starting translator, uh, A, of course, it's hard to get jobs. Uh, so we've been talking about that. Uh, but I also wanted to ask you about uh, the payment, the financial side of it, because I've got um, translator friends and I've got experience uh, with um, interpreting agencies. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, what is the accepted uh, in terms of receiving payments from clients, uh, either agencies or private clients? Because for example, in my experience, some tr interpreting agencies, there could be two months late with the payment, three months late with the payment. What is the um, tolerance threshold, would you say? Uh, and how would you deal with sort of problems? Because obviously you want to retain your clients and you want to maintain good rapport with the agencies as well because they are future source of work. Um, how would you balance sort of if, if payments are late, coming in late, but at the end you need the payments to pay your rent and so on. How would you deal with these situations? What would be your, what do you think the threshold for the um, um, lateness in terms of payment is? And Fortunately, I've not had any major problems, but I've, I've spoken to colleagues who do. Um, a reasonable payment term, so when you invoice to the time the client has to pay, would be 30 days. Um, some translators might be well within their rights to pursue late payment on day one that it's, that it's overdue. Myself, I would allow a maximum of another 30 days. If you do have major problems in obtaining payment from a client, there is legislation um, in your favour. You can start applying interest uh, onto that invoice um, and you could contact debt collection agencies. But so that, that we are really, really talking about extreme cases here. And once that happens with one of my clients, I, I don't work with them again. Um, especially if it's sort of the first payment. If it's a regular client I have, 
who's paid well um, you know, leading up to that, and then suddenly there's, a, there's quite a late payment. I might give them the benefit of the doubt once, but if it seems to be a recurring pattern, you don't work with them again. Um, as I work as a freelancer, I, I'm a business, so I set my own payment terms, and I, I fulfill my end of the bargain by delivering a good job. I expect the client to pay on time. I'm not as patient as Lloyd. <laughs> uh, I give him a call if it's a few days late. I send a reminder. And I have always been paid so far and will hopefully always be touch wood. But um, it's, it's a business transaction. It, it's not acceptable to pay late. It's not acceptable to live, deliver a job late and it's not acceptable to be paid late. Um, and if you can't rely on these clients to pay you on time, I would get some new clients. <laughs> I think you need to be strict with them from the outset mm -hmm. when you're negotiating with them before you even take on any jobs. You need to say, this is my payment term. If you don't pay by this deadline, I will take action. Without sort of frightening them off, but just to make it clear. Would you say the same about the agencies as well? Because there, there is the whole array of agencies out there. Um, sort of, would you be strict with the agencies as well? Or? Absolutely, I wouldn't, dif uh, I wouldn't differentiate between clients. I, don't think. I had a question I wanted to put, sorry, I'm interjecting. Um, it's about the idea of mentoring, which hasn't, I don't think has really come up, but I, but I was hoping would come up. The idea of mentoring. Um, now, I know in the EU institutions, we have a system of, of mentors. When you join, you're, you're assigned a, a more experienced translator. The idea is that the older translators uh, give some help to the new. Well, I joined the EU institutions quite late in my career. I was already beyond young when I joined. And the mentor that I was assigned was younger than me. So it was, uh, <laughs> but, he, but he still taught me an awful lot. Um, Catherine, does, does that scheme still exist? Do you have a mentor? How, how has that worked? And then perhaps the panel, how, how do you find mentoring? How do you um, contact more experienced translators and uh, get them to give you advice, other than coming to places like the London Language Show? Uh, yes, that scheme absolutely does still exist, um, certainly in the, the council where I work. Um, so uh, I was assigned a mentor um, within the department, within the English Translation Unit, who um, um, who I was able to go to with any sort of work-based questions, um, like if I had any questions on um, uh, the procedure for uh, translating documents, um, how to use um, um, SDL Studios, for example, uh, anything like that. And uh, I think I had a similar experience to Paul in that my mentor was probably <laughs> considerably younger than I am as well. Um, I also have a mentor outside of the department who, um, who I'm able to um, ask things like, um, I don't know, where are the, you know, where's the canteen or where are the best bars in Brussels, you know, things like that. So that that's, was actually really helpful when I first arrived. Okay. Um, I had a mentor when I joined the ITI Medical Network, um, I think they've, it's, it's only quite a recent thing that they've, they've started up. And I was paired with a translator who has a good 25, 30 years experience in medical translation, and that was with uh, French to English. The way it was structured was that um, we'd, we had an initial conversation, find out what, what I'm interested in, what I'm trying to specialize in, uh, what my background is, what my strengths, weaknesses, etc. Um, particularly for me, I was looking to be more confident writing medical text in that um, I, I was kind of at the point where I knew what I was doing was correct, whether it was adequate and acceptable for a medical professional to read um, is, is a slightly different thing. Um, we had, uh, over the space of about five or six months, three texts, which uh, I would translate, she would proofread, give me more information, um, have a little email exchange about what I found hard, easy, um, and ways that she thought I could improve. Um, and I found it a really enriching experience. Um, and uh, particularly with the lack of in-house training going on at the moment, I think it's, it should play a bigger role. Um, although the logistics of doing it 
is quite tricky. Um, it's, it's almost always going to be distance-based, um, particularly as people work in home offices. Um, getting enough that there's always going to be more demand than supply, I think. More de so more mentees and mentors. Um, and it's got to be... There has to be a will on... There has to be enough of a will from the profession uh, to, to want to help the younger generation, which um, recently I've seen a lot more of. Um, when I first went freelance, you, you kind of feel like you are on your own um, because you go from working in an office to working at home or working in a cafe or a pub, which I do sometimes. Um, <laughs> but um, and so, and so it's, quite, it's quite hard to get, to get to know people like that who, and I, and I think people are, a lot ready, are very ready to offer their experience and wisdom, um, but there aren't that many outlets to do so, um, which is why joining, joining Chart Chartered Institute of Linguists I've, and getting more involved with it has actually enabled me to, to make contact with a lot of people who are, uh, who can see that uh, you're young, interested, um, that, that they're ready to offer you help. I've had a couple of people pass me jobs before, got my first direct client through, through another translator as well. Um, as young people in translation, what are you doing differently, do you think, to, say, the previous generation? How are you breaking the rules? We're thinking more like business people. We're using... Well, social media is about now, which we, we are using, but um, we use it in a professional capacity. It's a way to build relationships with colleagues in a completely different way to previous generations would have ever been able to, uh, and potentially developing client relationships like that. Translation technologies. So we use a lot of new translation tools, which will help you keep people gain work basically yeah. I, I think with the technology we are we're a lot more mobile and a lot more flexible I'd have to agree with uh, Jessica and Tom and say the technology that's available now to assist translators uh, I think that's uh, the main difference yeah. I'd like to uh, thank our panel and, and uh, we've got Lloyd, Jessica Helen, Tom and Catherine so thanks to them uh, Thanks to you to, for coming. Thanks to our co-organizers, the CIOL and the ITI, Anne, Jack, Karen, and Jane. Uh, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks a lot.